Good morning. Good morning. Oh, no, please don't leave. I'm not going to sing, I promise. I know when I sing, my voice fills the room, and generally a lot of people leave to make room for it, but that's not my purpose here this morning. I am here to simply provide some updates as to what you might have expected from uh, the service this morning. During the week, uh, Pastor Jason, as you may know, he was scheduled to be here this morning to deliver the message, but his wife Carolyn and daughter Clara were feeling sick, and by Thursday he was feeling the same way, and when they discovered uh, after the testing, they all had COVID again. So he, uh, I believe his message this morning was going to be words of encouragement, and I am sure, in fact, that's what the family could use this morning, words of encouragement. Pastor Jason, if you're watching, which I think you probably are, know that our prayers are with you and we do send our words of encouragement. But we are very fortunate to have with us Pastor Isaac Amarin this morning, Jason's uh, father-in-law. He's a retired pastor, uh, but he has been continuing to serve as Savior in many ways uh, in pulpit supply, and we're very honored to have him here with us this morning. I believe his message is entitled, well, it's a message that's probably directed specifically at me. It's entitled, Restoration from Failure, the Story or the Life of a Toronto Maple Leafs Hockey Fan. <laughs> I just, it's just simply, of course, restoration from failure, but Pastor Amarin, we are indeed uh, thankful that you were here this morning, honored to have you with us, uh, and we look forward to the message that you will bring. Uh, and. Uh, to learn and grow from it as I know we will. Thank you. Scott.
Amen. Let's praise the Lord. And the Lord that we praise is the one that we want to walk with, to trust him and to obey him. the God that we trust and obey. We're going to labor unto glory for him until God's kingdom comes. My God, my God, where am I? Glory. Where
Where thorns no longer curse the ground, glory. At this time, we're going to take up our offering. Um, if you have brought a physical offering with you, you can leave it at the back um, in the box, or you can give through e-transfer at donation at victorybaptist.ca. <clears throat> As you might be able to hear, we uh, just finished a week of VBS, and my voice is shot, and it's been shot all week. But you know what? We had a wonderful, wonderful time. Praise God for all the great things that he did over this week. We saw, I had the pleasure of hearing 15 children tell me all five Bible verses from memory. 15. That's half. We had the opportunity to share the gospel for all five days. We talked about all kinds of big questions that these kids had and I'll tell you what, it was such a pleasure to be a part of it. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of our volunteers, all of the people who gave up their time and their energy, and I'll tell you what, it was a lot of energy that they gave up to serve these kids this week. But I just want to thank God for all that he has done. So as we pray, we're just going to thank the Lord for his work this past week, and we're going to ask him to bless the ministries that are continuing in this church throughout the summer and throughout the year. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, you are good. You are faithful to us in every season of our lives. And we see day after day your goodness and your mercy poured out upon us. I thank you for this past week of VBS where we saw 31 children experience the gospel day after day after day. What a pure joy it was to see you moving in their lives. We pray, Lord, for the seeds that were planted. Would we continue to be able to water them? Would you continue to lay your son upon them? And may you grow them up in the Lord. We ask, Lord, that those who have not put their faith in you, that they would put their faith in you, even today. And we ask, Lord, for the ministries that are going to continue in this church, both this coming week and throughout the rest of this year, we just pray that you would be in them all. We come before you humbly, knowing that without you, none of them are going to work the way they should. So we put them in your feet, and we lay our burdens at your feet. Lord, you are good and your mercy continues day after day after day. Lord, be with the preaching of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Children up to the age of seven, you are now free to follow your flag to your Sunday school class. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful time. Morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from uh, John chapter 21, verse 15 to 19. If you can open your Bibles and we have the scripture on screen as well, so please follow along. John 21, 15 starts, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? 
He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third, third time he said to him, John, Simon, John, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you addressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, folks. This is my third time at your church. Uh, last two times, my wife and I came to visit uh, our family, uh, Jason and our daughter, Carolyn, and the two granddaughters. And now, we're, now I'm here behind the pulpit. Little did I know. <laughs> but we pray that Jason and the family recoup well from this uh, illness. But uh, today, I wanted to talk about restoration from failure. And uh, if you want to keep your Bibles open to John chapter 21, we'll be looking at verses 15 to 19. And so, uh, there we are. Okay. Whoop. Okay, there we go. Becky Peppert is a global conference speaker and author of many books. She wrote a book many years ago called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World, a book about evangelism. And uh, one time she attended two different events on the same day. Now she went to a graduate psychology class at the Harvard University and a Christian Bible study adjacent to Harvard. She offered the following observations on how the two groups addressed or failed to address their failures, their problems, and their challenges. First, the students at the graduate level of psychology were extraordinarily open and candid about their problems. It wasn't uncommon to hear them saying, I'm angry, I'm afraid, I failed. Their admission of their problems was the opposite of denial. Second, their openness about their problems was matched only by their uncertainty about where to find the resources to overcome their problems and failures. Having confessed, for example, their inability to forgive someone who had hurt them, they had no idea how to resolve the problem by forgiving and being kind and generous instead of being petty and vindictive. So that was the first meeting she attended at Harvard, the psychology class. The next day, she went to uh, the other group, which was a Christian group, a Bible study group, adjacent to Harvard in Cambridge, next to Harvard. The contrast was striking. No one spoke openly about his or her problems. There was a lot of talk about God and answers and promises, but very little about the participants and the problems and the failures that they had faced. The closest thing to admission of sin or personal problem was a reference to someone who was st struggling and needed prayer. That was it. So the first group, the psychology class, seemed to have all the problems and no answers. And the second group, the Bible study, had all the answers and apparently no problems. Many times we as believers have a hard time admitting our failures, our problems, and our sins. We come to church and we put on this veneer sometimes, oh, everything's okay, I'm not hurting, oh, don't, I don't want to expose myself unless I'm judged or condemned. And so as Christians, we sometimes struggle at times with sin and spiritual failure. Okay, I'm one of those too. <laughs> Okay, 
Surprisingly, the Bible contains a museum of failed people. Isn't that true? We see this throughout Scripture. People have failed. The disciples failed. Even look at Peter. He really failed. And so the Bible records the spiritual failures of believers. Thankfully, they also record Christ's willingness to encourage them and to bring them back. We tend to cover our hero's failures, and we're even more likely to gloss over our own faults and failures. Instead, the Bible allows us to see the disciples' failures, and most of these stories came from the disciples themselves. See, we as Christians, we need each other as a community of believers and to be open with each other, even with our struggles and failures. We need, the Bible says in James, confess your faults one to another. Isn't that true? But we don't do that sometimes because we keep it to ourselves. But it's best to open up to someone you trust and someone that you've established a relationship with. Folks, listen to this. We always need someone in our lives. Even the Lone Ranger was not a Lone Ranger. He had his tonto. And we need our tontos. We need people to come alongside and help us. And the Bible says to seek the counsel of the wise and the godly in Proverbs. So we need to seek the counsel of the wise and the, pro- and the, and the, wise and, and, and the ones that care that show the love. You see, one of this, those disciples who failed and felt like giving up was the apostle Simon Peter. I like Simon Peter. I can relate to him, you know. Sometimes he would put his foot in his mouth and would say something and then he would fail. He did quite a, a, a few times fail the Lord, didn't he? Now let's look at Gospel John chapter 21. And there, the setting, we find the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after his resurrection. And John chapter 21 deals practically with the recovery from failure and the restoration of Peter's faith and to service, to serve Christ. Now, Peter is discouraged. We find him here. He's confused at a loss for what to do next in his life. Do you ever feel like that sometimes? When you fail the Lord and you feel like, well, like what am I doing? Where am I going to go? What, what should I be doing? And so th- he was a bit confused. What was going through his mind? Christ was alive, but he had let him down by denying him three times that, ever, that he ever knew him. He probably felt like a failure in thoughts of, what's the use? I'm a loser. Does Jesus still want to use me after I have filled him miserably? Have you ever had those thoughts? Well, it seems that everything that Peter and Jesus had experienced together, all their joys and trials and hardships had been counted as a failure by Peter himself because of his triple denial. His actions suggest that the only option... For him was to return to his former life as a fisherman. And thinking he had forfeited what he had spent the last three years following Jesus, he goes back to fishing. But I want you to see a passage here. Whoops. Okay, so I'm going to back... Okay, here, Simon. Sorry, folks, I'm just uh, getting used to this format here of high technology. (laughs) So remember Peter, he would give up his life for Jesus in Luke chapter 22. And this is what we read. This is what Jesus is saying to him. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. That means you're going to be tried. You're going to go through a trial. But Satan has asked permission to do that. You see, God is in absolute control. But look at this, verse 32, I love this. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And that's what Jesus does. When we are tempted and we're going through a severe trial or something is testing us, Jesus is praying for us that our faith will not fail. And so Jesus says to Simon, I'm praying for you, I'm interceding for you, that your faith will not fail. And then he goes on, and when you have turned back, what does that mean? 
That means repentance. Repentance is like you're walking this way, you're living in sin, and then when you repent, it's an action word. You turn around and you go back and stop going in that direction. And so Jesus is saying to Simon, I'm praying that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. There's your ministry. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you knew me. It seems Peter gave up the life of serving Christ. He said to himself probably many times, I failed the Lord, what's the use? I'm not worthy to follow him. I've made a blunder, and I might as well give up and go back to fishing. Well, that's what he said, going back to fishing. But listen, folks, Jesus didn't call him to go fish for fish. He called him to go for fish of men. Our problem is that we are too circumstantial. We focus on our circumstance and our failures and, and, and we get discouraged and, and uh, we don't see that the Lord is working in us. Listen, our life is a process. It's a work in progress. Jesus is moving in us and he's working in us. And, and uh, we have this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I love this. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, what will he do? He will carry it on until the day of Christ when Christ appears to gather his church. So we have a promise here. Being confident. Are you confident of this? That he who began a good work in you and me, He's going to bring it to completion. And this is what Jesus was doing in Peter's life. Yeah, Peter, you failed me. But I'm confident, being confident of this, that I'm going to bring it to completion. Now, folks, I want you to look at this uh, screen here, and I want you to, re to read after me, not right now, but I'm going to say this. The Lord does not focus on our failures, but on our potential. Amen. Say it with me. The Lord does not focus on our failures, but on our potential. And that's what Jesus did with Peter. He didn't focus on his failures. He focused on the potential of Peter. Why? Because he was working in his life, and he, what he began the good work in his life, he was going to bring it to completion. Aren't you glad that the Lord does not give up on us when we fail? After the disciples spend time trying to catch fish with no results, Jesus is barbecuing on the shore some fish. I can almost smell that fish because I often go to the Azores. That's where I'm from. I was born in the Azores, the Portuguese islands, and they serve fish, fresh fish and barbecued fish, and I know that smell. And so Jesus is barbecuing fish, and he tells them from the shore in the near distance to cast their nets on the right side. What? <laughs> We're not catching anything. <laughs> what about <laughs> the right side? And then what happens? They catch and they haul in a huge net filled with fish. Then later on, they recognize that it was Jesus. And Simon Peter gets out of the boat and he wades through the water to get to Jesus. He's always the one who takes the initiative. And then later, the others join in the meal. But uh, Jesus says here, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, 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 do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. What did Jesus mean more than these? Did he mean more than your companions? Did he mean more than the fish and the boats and the nets? And the, your old occupation of being a fisherman, do you love me more than these? And so Christ's question was one which probed the deepest motives of Peter's heart. What are the motives of your heart towards Christ? Do you love him more than these, more than your material possessions, more than making money? your friends, your entertainment, and your computer games. Whatever occupies your time, your energy, and resources, do you love Jesus more than these things? Can I tell you? These things that we hold on to, they're going to perish. 
according to 2 Peter 3, it's all going to burn. And listen, folks, you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. <laughs> you can't take it. Job said, I came into this world naked and I leave naked. That's the truth. Do you love me more than these? And Jesus said this in, in Matthew. He said, uh, for wherever your treasure is, there is your heart. There your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? What do you value in your life right now? Do you value the things that you have and the people around you? Or do you really value Jesus Christ? Do you really love Jesus? Do you really value him more than anything else? And that's what Jesus is asking Peter. Do you love me more than these? Also that Jesus never brings up the three denials that Peter had made. He doesn't bring up his past or his failure. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't say, well, Peter, didn't I tell you that you were going to deny me three times? What's the matter with you? Get your act together. Did Jesus do that? No. He didn't even mention his failure. How do we know? Well, the Bible says he wept bitterly. After he denied his Lord the third time, the Bible says he wept bitterly. That's repentance. How do we know that? Well, 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Feeling the worldly sorrow is being sorry. Sorry you got caught. Sorry you fell. Sorry you failed. But true repentance, and this is why Peter wept bitterly. He had godly sorrow. He repented. And Jesus knew that he was going to repent because he was praying that his faith would not fail and that he would turn back. Isn't that wonderful that Jesus doesn't focus on your failure and your past sins? But you know what our problem is? We drag our sins with us. We drag our failures. Oh, poor me. Oh, I can't do anything for the Lord. Look at me. But God doesn't see that. He's working in us. He's trying to bring us out of that and looking at our potential. Not at our failures, but our potential. So when we repent, the Lord not only forgives but he doesn't hold our sin and failures against us. Aren't you glad that he doesn't hold sin against us when we repent and confess? Now, we have a beautiful verse in Hebrews 8.12. It says, I will forgive their wickedness and, I, and will remember their sins. No what? No our problem is we don't forget our sins. And we keep rehashing it. We keep playing the same old thing. Christians, a lot of Christians are living in the past. They're wasting the present time to get ahead with Jesus and to do something for Jesus. But the enemy of your soul will try to enslave you to the past and to your failures. And that's what was happening with Peter. He knew he denied his Lord. He says, well, let's go back to fishing. Let's go back to the old life. He was discouraged. He wanted just to go back and leave the whole thing. But Jesus says, no, Peter, do you love me? That's what Jesus asks you and me when we have failed sometimes. Do you love me? Where's your heart? That's the most important. And then Isaiah 43, it says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Behold, I'm doing something new. I love this verse. What does it say? Do, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Behold, I'm doing something new. Aren't you glad that God is doing something new? I pray that this message will have a catharsis. You know what a catharsis is? It's a cleansing and a renewal of your faith. So we have these passages of Scripture that God, for, when we repent, he not only forgives, but he forgets. And then we go on, and then Jesus here in chapter 21, verses 15 and on, Jesus twice asked Peter, do you love me? And he uses the word agape, means sacrificially. And so, of course, Peter can't respond with agape. 
Actually, Peter responds with philos. That means I'm very fond of you. I'm not sure if I can really sacrifice my life because I said I was going to go to prison and die for you, and I didn't. I denied you. Jesus is asking Peter, do you agape me? Lord, I'm very fond of you. (laughs) And that's the way he responds. And so we have this word here, agape, and then love sacrificially. That's what, for God so loved, for God agape the world so much that he gave his only son, a sacrifice for us, for our sins. But the word philos is fond of you as a friend. And so that's how Peter answered, because he knew, Lord, you know, back there I said I would go to prison and die for you, but I don't know if I can right now love you sacrificially and lay down my life for you. But I'm very fond of you. And there's some Christians who are like that, you know, I'm very fond of Jesus and what he's done and all that, but I don't know if I can really sacrifice my life for him and to give all my all, my time, my energy, my resources to him. Peter could not confess a deep sacrificial love for Christ, which is implicit in the word, do you love me? And so, but do you know something? Let's just go back a little bit. So the third time that Jesus says to him, Peter, do you philos me? Peter is hurt now. He says, Lord, you know I philos you a lot. Feed my lambs. So Jesus is looking really at the issue of his heart about the motive of his heart. Love. I know right now you can't agape me, but do you know, are you very fond of me? And Peter says, I'm very fond of you. And then in the next verse, Jesus says that, how he's going to die. And he foretells his death. That in the end, Peter is going to agape Jesus. He is going to lay down his life. And we know from church history that Peter was crucified. And so here we have Jesus encouraging Peter. And he says to him, Take care of my sheep. Take care of my precious believers, Peter. I know you have the gift of leadership which I've given to you. And Peter, I'm restoring you. I'm not going to focus on your failures. I'm going to focus on your potential, what you are going to do for me and my glory. And your death is going to be for my glory. Wow. It's beautiful. And so, Peter is restored to ministry. His faith is restored. Now, he is a fisher of men, not a fish. Now, he has a purpose and a call on his life. He knows what he needs to do now is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did. To the very end, he was faithful. And he persevered to the very end. So when we have failed the Lord sometimes, the Lord asks this question, do you love me? He desires to restore our relationship of love. And so when you feel like you failed, he says, do you really love me? I know you've sinned. I know you've fallen into sin. I know you've failed. But you repented, right? You confessed your sin and you repented. And and that sin is forgotten. I'm not going to hold that against you. So why are you holding it against yourself? Stop it. Folks, there are some believers who are holding on to their failures. Maybe some of you here this morning. And Jesus is saying to you, listen, repent. Do you love me? That is the most important of all. Do you love me? That's what Jesus has been doing here. So let's read this together, can we? The Lord doesn't focus on our failures, but our potential. I hope you remember this phrase. I hope you remember through your whole life, the Lord does not focus on my failures, but my potential. I pray that God will bless your memory cells. There'll be no static in the attic. (laughs) That you remember. 
Okay, let's say it one more time. The Lord does not focus on our failures, but on our potential. Isn't that what Jesus did with Peter? Amen. I know you're not Pentecostal, but at least let's have a little amen. <laughs> yes, amen. Amen. And so Peter is encouraged. And Peter is an encouragement to me because in spite of his failures and weakness, Jesus focuses on his potential because he knew where Peter's heart was. That's the beauty of the thing. The Lord knows where your heart is. The Lord does not focus on our failures and weaknesses, but like we, but he focuses on our potential. It's about our potential for him and what we can do through him, his grace and power. We can do it. We have Do you know we have potential as Christians? Yes. What did Paul say? I can do all things through Christ who? Strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's the potential. Not in me, but it's in Christ. I can do all things, not some things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Okay, folks, come on. <laughs> Amen. Okay. I'm a little Baptocostal, by the way, so <laughs> in case you're wondering. Anyway, but uh, remember what it says in, in um, Isaiah. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past like Peter was. Behold, I am doing a new thing. And what did Jesus do? He did a new thing in Peter's life, didn't he? He said, Peter, he didn't even bring up the denials, didn't bring up the past and his sin. It's already forgiven and forgotten. Peter, it's a new page, a new lease on life. I'm doing a new thing right now. So he's talking about the present right now. Live for me, serve me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy of our souls wants to trip us up and to bind us, to enslave us to our failures, to our past, to our sins. But Jesus wants to free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Wow, you know the scriptures. God bless your memory cells. Yes. Do you love me? Do you love me? Then serve me. And so that's what Jesus did. So, I want to share with you a story that happened to me just a few years ago. I usually go to a coffee shop where I spend quite a bit of time meeting folks, and that's my area of evangelism, where I share the gospel of Jesus Christ with non-believers. And uh, I'm an evangelist at heart, and I like to, my, my personal mission statement is to populate heaven for the glory of Christ. That's what motivates me every day is to connect with people and to share the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. And I, I, I do have quite a few people who at the coffee shop who come and sit with me. I'm not a threat to them. I'm not this religious nut. And uh, I connect with them with humor. I use a lot of humor and jokes, you know, dad jokes, folks. You know, it goes a long way. Anyway... I had an experience. Uh, one, t one day I went to the coffee shop early in the morning. It opens at 6 a.m. I couldn't sleep, and so I walked downtown Cambridge, and I sat at the table, ordered a coffee and uh, a toast, and then I get my cell phone, and uh, the site I was looking at is called In Christ Alone, and they had a devotional. And the guy was talking about Elvis Presley's song, I Can't Help Falling in Love With You. So I'm looking at this, and I... Okay, this is getting sappy. This is for women, not for me. So I put my phone down. As soon as I put my phone down, God is my witness. Elvis Presley came on the sound system singing this song. <laughs> I get goosebumps. And I'm hearing this song by Elvis, and I pick up the phone, and I begin to read the rest of it. And folks, I'm in tears. It was an epiphany. And Jesus was asking, Isaac, how much do you love me? 
And I said, Lord, I can't help falling in love with you. I really can't. Lord, I, I truly love you from the bottom of my heart. You mean a lot to me. And I can almost hear the voice of Jesus saying, yes, I know. That's what Jesus asks of you and me. Do you love me? More than these. Are you going through some times of challenge and failure and problems in your life right now? Can I say to you right now? Confess it. Repent. Jesus is doing a new thing in your life right now. May God help you not to dwell on the past, but use the time to go forward with Jesus Christ. Can we stand, please, if you are able to? Okay, we're going to read this one more time. Because that's the theme of this whole message. The Lord does not focus on our failures, but on our potential. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you're doing a new thing here this morning in this church. And those that are watching by Close Circuit TV and the Internet, I pray right now that they will release their failures to you right now and say, Lord... I confess that I have failed you. I confess that I have fallen in sin. And Lord, I repent. I am going to turn away from it. And Lord, I'm going to now live a life dedicated to you. And I'm not going to live in the past nor in my failures anymore. I am starting a new lease on life right now for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. God bless you. What a wonderful message. Would you stand and sing with us together? I speak the name of Jesus over you in your hurting I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing that circumstances would change. I pray. Yeah.
circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. Well, thank you so much for coming, Isaac, and sharing that message with us. It was so wonderful to hear what you had to say from the Lord. I know myself, I often find myself in a place where my failures define me. And I often need that reminder to let them go, to let them be in the past. And what we're going to do is we're going to close our service with a couple of announcements, and then I'm going to leave you with a scripture that I just, I, I felt the Lord telling me to share with you as we go. But before we do, I'd like to ask Doug to come and give a brief announcement. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Many of you know that my wife and I have been involved with Christian Mission Aid for many, many, many years. And there's a number of people here in the church who have supported phys uh, financially and prayerfully of the mission over the years. And so now we have the new uh, report for 2022, and so if you're interested and in get a copy of it or uh, supporting the ministry, I'll be out the front there and uh, you can pick up a copy. Thank you. <laughs> this week is junior high camp. We are so excited to have a group of about 10 junior highs joining us to go on all kinds of adventures, to hear from the Word of God, and to just have a great time together. So if you would be in prayer for us this week as we uh, spend this time ministering to these young lives. I know there are a couple in this room who are going to be joining us, and if you are listening, which I hope you are, get hyped! I get to put my youth pastor hat on for that sentence. It was a lot of fun. This week, Jason Dahmer will be on vacation. We're praying for a speedy recovery from COVID so we can enjoy that vacation. So if there's anything that you need to uh, speak to him about, please don't. <laughs> please instead contact the church office and we'll be happy to help you as best we can. Jason Klebine will be back in the office this week. I'm, I, we're praying that he enjoyed his vacation. From the sounds of it, he most certainly did. Uh, if you're new or if this is, or you have been joining us just recently and haven't had a chance to connect with us as a church, we'd invite you to fill out a connect with us card in the front pocket in front of you. And if you, once you've filled that out, take that to the information desk and there'll be a gift there for you. We're so glad that you've joined us today. And we hope to see you again and again and again and again in perpetuity. And let me just leave you with this word from the Lord as you go. In Jude, which has no chapters because it's just one chapter, verse 24, it says this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace today.